I love these people. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Is Gator and Bruce in here? Well, they need to be in here for the service. All right. No matter what outreach we have, we, how many people know we still need the word? Amen. Hallelujah. So, uh, we're going to do the second installment of Healing for the Heart. You know, so many things come out. The Bible, we re read a lot of scripture. I'm not going to do all those scriptures that we did last time, but, but a lot of scriptures deal with the heart. And uh, it's an interesting thing that we are instructed in the Word of God to love the Lord our God with all our heart. I said all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, if we're instructed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, evidently it's possible to love Him with just part of our heart. And uh, if we, without getting too much into it, if we understand that the, that the heart involves, there's an overlapping that happens between the soul and the spirit, and, uh, uh, and so we need to understand that they're not the same thing, but, uh, but they overlap and they interact with each other. And so uh, the issues that we have in life really arise from the heart. The Bible says out of the heart come all the issues of life. All the issues of life are heart issues. When people say, uh, um, what do you think the reason is that, uh, 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 that, that some people miss so much church? I can tell you what it is. It's a heart issue. It's not whether or not they're saved. If you never went to church, you could still know Jesus, couldn't you? And, uh, it's, and some people uh, uh, wonder about that. So, did you know you can fill your mind with the Word of God and still have a heart problem? Because it's not just having knowledge. We don't need just information, but we need revelation about God. Amen? And uh, so you can have a lot of scriptures up in your mind, but, but if, you, if it hasn't really been revealed to your heart what it's all about, then you're not making an emotional connection with God and really accomplishing things in your life like you should be able to accomplish. Amen? Uh, I heard somebody say a long time, What's the, you're getting your giving receipts, and I know most people that are giving. Some, uh, some of you are going to say, man, we really did good this year. And others are going to say, I thought I gave more than this. And did you know that, uh, 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 am I saying there's never a money problem? No, but did you know what giving is? Giving is a heart problem. It's always a heart problem. They said, well, I can't give 10%. If you made it, 10% is the most... Uh, uh, fair thing that you could do. If you only made a dollar this week, you'd give a dime of it. That's Bible. Not, it's not Bob. If it was Bob, it'd be something else. You'd buy chrome for the pastor. <laughs> you'd send him on trips. You know, all that kind of good stuff. No, but listen, <laughs> let me get serious. Most of our problems are heart problems. Out of our heart come all the issues of life. And so that's the reason it's important. And the more that I study it, the more I realize. And always remember this. When I'm preaching to you, God spoke it to me first. So if anything I say ever go, kind of rubs you the wrong way, understand God rubbed me the wrong way first. And I'm just, it, you, you're just getting it. You know, that's like when uh, somebody came up one time when I worked pipeline, you know, and man, we'd all really gotten chewed out. And they said, well, did you get chewed out? I, he, they said, you, you know, you're, you're the boss. I said, no, I'm an, I'm an underboss to the big boss. So did I get chewed out? Yes, that, you know what, flows downhill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. But at any rate, so uh, almost all the reasons we come to Jesus in the beginning of our Christian walk are somewhat f selfish. We're tired of a destructive lifestyle. 
We're tired of being addicts. We're, we're tired of being alcoholics. We're tired of being happy with our lives. And, and uh, we're tired of the emotional pain that we're going through. And, and we realize there's something better. And God speaks to our heart. And, and the Word of God produces faith. And then we call out upon the Lord. But God reached out to us first. We didn't reach out to Him first. So we open ourselves up to new options, something else that can really come in my life and make a change. And so this really uh, 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 begs the question, uh, if, if I so much wanted to change, why am I so resistant to it? On one hand, I wanted a difference in my life. On the other hand, I only want a difference in certain areas of my life. Not my whole life. When you first joined Heart of God Fellowship, you signed a membership covenant. And when you, when you signed that membership covenant, and we have another covenant that tells what, what us what is it to be a leader. Now, the one that, both of those covenants were actually decided by this congregation. In other words, I went like this, and I said, what do you think is important for a believer and somebody who's a member of a church? And, the, and you guys went through a list of things. We put them all down, and we, we looked them up. They were all biblical. And then we all agreed to it. But somewhere between the, the understanding that's what we ought to be and the actual experiential part of it where we actually become that, there's a disconnect. And the disconnect happens in the heart. It, it doesn't mean we're bad people. It's just that, that we haven't really allowed the life of Christ to come into us to the place where we have a depth of experience that's, that's transformational. Does that make sense to you? And so we, uh, 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 I, I, the, as a loving father, God longs for that missing relationship, regardless of what compels us to come home. He wants us to come home. He wants to deliver his children from their pain. You know that Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And saves such as have a contrite spirit. He's a loving father. And he cares for his children. He loves us. His reason for wanting us to follow him is because it's through the development of that relationship that I have with Jesus and with the Father. It's through that relationship that my experience at life becomes its very best. Because he doesn't lead me uh, into terrible places. He he leads me into a life of abundance. He cares about me living a life of peace and a life of joy. And he, he likes, even though he knows there are struggles in life, he wants me to be my very best that I can possibly be. And so he's working on me uh, to do that. Now the problem is, is that if we understand what it is to be really complete in Christ, it says in Colossians that in him we are complete. And again, I want to remind you, I'm not changing any of that because it is true that I am complete in Christ. That's who God has declared me to be through the finished work of the cross. But try to remember that even though all of my sins have been forgiven and I have a special place in the heart of God, experientially, I have to uh, do that day by day. I get, I, I'm saved and, and I'm locked into eternal life. There's no doubt about that. All my sins have been taken care of. Yet, it is also a fact that as I walk on this, in this life, I come up to problems every day. Sometimes hourly. Sometimes I think it's happening every minute. And at those, those times, what do I have to do? Well, at those times... I have that decision to make all, uh, all over again. I have to decide, am I going to do it God's way or am I going to do it my way? I made a decision to give my life to Christ, but somewhere, sometimes, if the heart isn't right where it needs to be, there's a disconnect between what God has ordained me to be and what I actually experience as a Christian. Now, let's be honest with you. How many people admit there's a little bit of a disconnect, and I'd like to become more that God wants me to be. Amen. Amen. So that's why we're talking, and I'd like to say I'm done this, I'll get done this week, but I know better than that. 
when it comes to this subject of the heart. Jesus said this. He said, this is eternal life in John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is. You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, even though all these things are experientially good for us, he didn't say, this is eternal life, that you serve in the Sunday school of the choir of your church. That's not eternal life. Uh, he didn't say that you make yourself uh, righteous, because that wouldn't be eternal life. You stink at righteousness. There's a whole list of things that religion may require that Christ did not require. And so what the thing is, is that he has made us one thing spiritually, but to have that come out uh, experientially in our life day to day, the connection between what God has made us and what we're walking out in our day to day experience is a hard experience, is what we are in our hearts. John said we love him because he first loved us. We don't get saved because we love God. We're too stupid to love God. We didn't come to God because uh, of that. We came to God because he loved us first. He's always the one that took the initiative to come and get us. He loves us. There's an awareness of being loved, as a matter of fact, is the basis for ours being able to love other people. Our, our love experience with God is what enables us to love other people. That's the reason he said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Why did he put loving God first? Because apart from loving God, we're no good at loving anybody else. Amen? And then he tells us in 1 John that if we say we have love for God, but we don't love our brother, we're a liar. Because loving God comes first, amen? And before we could love God, he loved us. I love him. Because he first loved me. And you think about what you were like when you first had the realization that God loved you. That first revelation that God loves you. And if you're in here today, and you're constantly trying to work you are trying to work through your own effort to make yourself acceptable and do things right with God, you don't have a revelation of his love for you. You don't have a revelation of it. The truth about it is that there's something about resting in that finished work of God and allowing him uh, uh, to really be everything to us. You can't experience the life of God, for instance, and walk in defiance of his word. On one hand, if I say that I'm in love with God, and the other one says, but I'm going to do things my way, those things don't match up. They don't. Amen? You can't experience the life of God and walk in defiance. You can't be experiencing the love of God and hate your brother. Yet obeying his word does not equate to having life or love. Paul makes the contingency for putting on this new man twofold. First, you must have heard and believed the precise and accurate truth in Christ. And I have news for you. It's not as prevalent as it should be. Because religion is preached a whole lot more than Jesus is. First, you, 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 you have to have heard and believed the precise and accurate truth in Christ. And secondly, you, you have to put off the old man and die to self. We're not good at dying, self, dying to self. We love self a lot. From the time that we're born... We care more about us than we do anything else. I remember one time when I said that, 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 that we're born with a sin nature. And this one mom came up to me and she goes, I don't believe that's true. Babies are adorable. Yes, they're adorable. They don't have a sin nature. Well, then put something both of them want in front of them. And they'll beat each other up trying to get to it. It's... 
we're born with a sin nature. And so the, the thing about it is, is that we need to realize that from the very beginning. I love what the way this one comedian said it. He said, you know what, we're, we're pretty insecure in our experience. Because, he said, here we are in this safe and warm womb. And uh, we've been in mother's womb for nine months. And everything is given to us. And we got everything we need. And all of a sudden, <coughs> We're out in the cold, cruel world. Somebody puts stuff in our eyes to clear our eyes. Others smacks us on the butt. And now we're crying and we're upset. And we spend the rest of our life, umbilical cord in hand, looking somewhere to plug in. <laughs> I said, that's a pretty accurate deal. And because we're pretty insecure in a lot of things, you know. And, and, and the reality of it is, it, it's, it's basic human nature to be selfish. So when Jesus teaches to die to self, that's not really that easy thing to do, is it? Yet he provided a way. The, provi the, the provision for us to die to self is to put him number one in our lives. Amen? If the gospel we heard is not bringing forth fruit unto godliness, we either did not hear the truth, or we've not actuated it with precise and accurate knowledge. Let me say that again. If the gospel we heard is not bringing forth fruit unto godliness. In other words, e even if you're going like this and saying, Oh man, I'm in love with the Lord. But it hasn't produced godliness inside of your life. Somewhere you haven't heard the, the true accurate gospel of Jesus Christ or if you heard it you're not allowing it to take over your life if we have fellowship with him share the same life he now has then his life will be mirrored in our life right now we have a lot of Christians trying to think this thing out and remember all their steps and to act like a Christian and in their own strength tried to be a Christian rather than allowing the life of Christ to operate through us, which is so much easier. If my life is not being continually transformed, it means that at some point I have stopped looking at Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand this, because I know that God can do mighty things, but I talked to a guy who was an alcoholic, and he decided he didn't need to go to AA anymore. He's, he's, he's done with AA. And I knew somehow, probably by the Holy Spirit, that he needed to get back to meetings. Uh, we had, uh, uh, when, I was, when I was the head of a mission down in Oklahoma for a long time, we had a, uh, one thing you had to do when you joined the mission you had to do 90 meetings in 90 days. You couldn't, you couldn't miss a day. Those in recovery know what I'm talking about. You couldn't miss a day. Well, one guy had been a couple of months, and he decided, you know what? Really, I got this together. I said, you need to stay at the meetings. You need to stay at the meetings. No, really, really. I have been delivered by the hand of the Lord. That's a great thing. But see, there was, there, there, there was a disconnect, I knew, between that which he had heard and his experience wasn't there yet. The heart hadn't been transformed yet. And so he decided, I don't need to go to meetings. Well, pretty soon he was right back out drunk again. You know what I'm saying? So there are some things that we do, but if the heart motivation isn't there to do it, you won't continue in it. You won't. We have to have a heart change. By the time I get done with this series, I really want you to realize that no matter who we are, we need to constantly have our heart changed through our fellowship with the Lord. If you could just intelligently say, here's what I need, so I'll do it. That'd be great. But when disconnected from the heart, it won't ever work. People get seduced into false doctrines and false thoughts and, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's all because they left the light that only comes by fellowship, sharing in the resurrection reality of Jesus. People stop fellowshipping with God 
and start looking for personal divine revelation from somewhere else. Uh, there are branches that are losing their life-giving connection to the vine. i got to stay hooked into the vine, man. Now, don't misunderstand me. Our church has a purpose. But the Bible doesn't say heart of God fellowship is the vine. Jesus is the vine. i got to stay hooked in to Jesus. You know, uh, uh, we have people sometimes that will come to this church and they'll say, Man, I love the Word because you are preaching from the Word and it's transformational. But I, I don't want to argue with them, but it's only transformational if it comes from your head to your heart. If it's just in your head, it's not transformational. It has to be a heart change that comes out of it. Beholding doctrine has no power to transform you. I knew of a church, large church in, in Kansas City. It was a large Baptist church, a great church. But he spent about 12 weeks uh, preaching on the Baptist distinctives. And I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister, so I understood what he was talking about. The Baptist distinctives. In other words, what makes a Baptist different than everyone else? Can I tell you about this? I know that's, on, that's a load of crap. You're not going to get to heaven and find out there's a Baptist section and then the rest of them have to go somewhere else. <laughs> the truth about it is, beholding doctrine has no power to transform you. Beholding Jesus is where the power that's in you comes alive. Because healing, and I used to tell people this and it took them a while to get it, but but. There are so many things that are done inside the church that don't make sense. Christians have gotten to the place where they believe that unless this mighty man of God lays hands on you, you can't receive a healing. But what they forget is, I'm not praying or believing for a healing that somehow is coming out of heaven to me. God lives on the inside of me. Healing is on the inside of me. Righteousness is on the inside of me. Peace is on the inside of me. Joy is on the inside of me. Everything that God says I can have is already on the inside of me. The connection between what God has done in the Spirit to me and how I walk it out in this world is my heart. Is my heart. If I acknowledge that I share in healing, because together Christ and I rose from the dead, conquering sickness and disease, then I can actuate healing in my kidneys Amen. with your cancer, Amen. with whatever it is. But I need to get to the place, I need to get to the place where I have a hard understanding that I shared in the healing because. Christ and I both arose from the dead, conquering sickness and disease. That way I can actuate it. We never have to get these things. We have these things. The question is, am I experiencing them? My faith comes alive as I commune around the truth of it all, that we share through his death, burial, and resurrection with the clear and accurate knowledge that these good things are already in me, in Christ. In fellowship, I see this in him, but I also see it in me. Apart from fellowship, I don't see it in him, so I can't see it in me. Jesus explained, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Amen. Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. I want to tell you something. I can preach here uh, uh, over and over every week of my life. I can feed the homeless, minister to bikers, go into the hospitals and pray for healing people. I can do all these wonderful works, but if I don't have a heart transformation, I'm still not where God wants me. Amen? I need to have a heart transformation. 
Somebody asked me years ago, how can you, when God calls you to go speak to somebody that's inside of a bar, do something inside of a bar, how can you do that? Because I've had a heart transformation. If all I had was uh, intellect that understood the word, I wouldn't be prepared for what the devil tries to throw at me. We're going to look at uh, uh, the sower and the seed, a parable that Jesus gave to us. He said, well, I'm not going to read the scripture right now, but I'm going to give you some key points because you've read it before. The, the, the key points are this inside that parable that Jesus gave the disciples. You have the seed, which represents the word, and the soil, which represents the heart. You have the things that prevent the word from getting into and taking root in your heart. When I'm talking about transformation, I'm talking about somehow getting the word into my heart, not just into my mind. Then you have the instructions about how to get the word into your heart in a way that will bear fruit. In, in Jesus' introduction to the parable, you have a bonus that's usually missed. The answer doesn't come till after his explanation of it. You have the key to how you'll understand all parables. I believe it would be safe. All things pertaining to God are understood by this. The first misunderstanding about this parable is the seed sown by the wayside. The seed that's sown by the wayside was never in the heart. It never was sown in the heart. The translators complicated this even more when you study it out uh, by inserting a word that's not in the original text. Satan didn't steal a word from someone's heart. The word heart's not in the original text. And obviously the word was never sown in their heart. It was sown where? By the wayside. When it says Satan came immediately... It, it, it really meant he found a place of influence. Satan came to Jesus after he'd been fasting for 40 days. He didn't enter Jesus' heart. There wasn't no place in Jesus' heart for the enemy. He simply found a place of opportunity through his hunger from fasting, through his calling, and through his identity. And there are the three areas where Jesus was challenged. He was only challenged those areas because he was the only opportunity provided by what God had showed him up to that point. The first group heard in this parable, but it never entered their heart. How many people know we need to get the word of God into our heart? The second group had the word sown on stony ground. The fact that it could not find a root would indicate once again that even though the word was received, it really had no access to the heart. The King James Version, when persecution arose for the word's sake... But the original text says pressure arose through the word and they became offended. I'm going to give you a truth right now. The truth that has the most potential to set you free has the most potential to offend you. Do you know why? It may be truth, but when the word is in opposition to my opinion, it means I'm wrong and I don't want to be wrong. So sometimes the truth comes to us and we'll go, no. I've had the truth spoken to me before, or I see it inside of the Word of God and it makes me mad. Because it's not what I want to do. You know, you got your giving receipts, or some people don't want to tithe. They know that God wants them to tithe. They know that God wants them to give. We've preached on it many times. I've had people say, well, you know what? That church don't need money. If you're giving to this church, you're missing the whole thing anyway. The fact that you write a check to the church, the Bible says that, do you know who receives tithes, it says in Hebrews? Jesus. You write, a, you write it to Heart of God Fellowship, but Jesus is receiving it. Amen? And so I have some people that say, hey, you know, if you're a leader, it's even worse than that. Did you know that? In this church, if you're a leader and you don't tithe, you won't remain a leader. You know why? Because if you don't tithe, the Bible calls you in Malachi 3 a robber. And how many people think I should put robbers in leadership positions here? Would that be good? No, we don't want robbers in leadership positions. The first time I said that, I had some other leaders come to me and say, well, you know, that's kind of harsh. 
You know why? Now, now, now listen. Because it's the truth, but it comes against my opinion of what I want to do, so I don't want to hear it. Like when God would tell me at the beginning of my Christian walk, you got to get rid of this violence, this anger and violence in you. And you know what? The problem in hearing that from God was? It really pissed me off. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It had been part of my lifestyle for so long, I did not want to hear that. But the reality of it is, that's the problem. That truth that you receive can set you free, but if it goes against your opinion, it can offend you at the same time. Some of the truths that set you free are, first of all, offensive. When Ezra the scribe first read the word to him in Malachi, in uh, Nehemiah, uh, they were hurt. They were crying. They were angry because they hadn't been doing the word. And then the Bible turns around, and when it was explained to them, then they received joy, and the, that's where that scripture comes in, where the joy of the Lord is your strength. But sometimes don't feel like strength when you first hear it, is it? How many people want the Word of God? Do you only want the words that are your favorite word, or do you want the whole word? You came in a good church for that. We're working on heart transformation. When the Word is in opposition to my opinion, it means I am wrong. It doesn't mean God is wrong. It means I am wrong. It doesn't mean God's trying to pick, uh, pick on me. It means He's trying to set me free. Because my opinions got me to where I am. <laughs> Only God's opinion can get me out of what I am. Matter of fact, Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure or what you value, not just, not just money, but what you treasure, the things that are valuable to you, it's there where your heart will be also. Some people love the world, and so the love of or the value for God is not in them. There's something about people that are so sold out to Jesus. If you're Catholic, you know who Mother Teresa is or was. And the interesting thing is, I thought it was always interesting to me that when some people were asking, how can we, because she was in Calcutta, and working with the lepers. And they said, what can we do? How do you want us to pray for you? And I love what she said. She said this right here. Pray that the, my work with the lepers won't become more important to me than my relationship with Christ. And yet we still have those problems today because what happens is when people get involved with ministry, sometimes their ministry to the homeless, to the bikers, to the church, to the children, to their becomes more important than their personal intimacy with Christ, and you're in trouble when that happens. Amen? Hallelujah. So there's another little spiritual law, and that's that when God's truth hits me, uh, and I make excuses for not changing. As long as I have an excuse, I have not really confessed or repented. When I know something is the truth, but I decide I'm going to do things my own way, then I haven't really confessed and repented and decided I'm going to go the direction God wants me to go. And I'd like to tell you that's a one-time event, but it's a day-to-day -day event. Salvation happened instantly. I don't ever have to worry about whether or not I'm saved. Even when I get mad at God and do things I shouldn't, I'm still saved. I may be acting like a disobedient little child, but I'm still saved. I'm God's child. But I want to tell you something. I want my experience to be rich and full with Jesus. Amen? God has a desire to reveal everything to us. 
He's not out to hide anything from us. He wants us to live the best life we can. Amen? That's the reason in those same set of scriptures, he went in somebody, lots of times people will act like it was a different concept, but it's really not because of the same set of scriptures he gets into letting them know, well, you don't take a light and hide it under a bushel basket. You want it to spread light everywhere. So he's letting them know the reason I'm revealing how to understand parables and everything else because I'm not going to have light and then hide it from you. God wants to reveal things to us. Amen? But we're, the key is, do we have ears to hear? Then his next words tell us how to have hearing ears. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Take heed. This is what you do with what you hear. Look at it until you perceive it. Take note. Handle it with care. Act like what God says is the most important thing in your life. Because it's supposed to be. Ponder on it. Consider it. Think about it. Meditate on the word that you receive. It's like cultivating the seed. Those that don't bear fruit are the ones that the Bible calls forgetful hearers. I don't want to be a forgetful hearer. I want to get on with what God's speaking to me. Did you know righteousness of the heart? Along those lines, righteousness of the heart is not an automatic state of being. It's the result of believing God. Uh, the word repentance does not mean one repentance covers everything. It really means that any time something is revealed to me, a direction I should go, then I should change the direction I'm going now and go the way that God wants me to go. Does everybody understand that? So the things I have to handle all the time. So we're completely righteous, but we're experiencing righteousness in our daily life one area and one decision at a time I've been proclaimed righteous in the eyes of God I've saved but how I experience that righteousness is a decision I have to make all the time people that don't make that decision lose their joy they don't lose their salvation they lose the joy of their salvation Sometimes what chokes out the word is not the desire for other things, but among the truly serious, it's usually religion. Religion doesn't renew your mind to the finished work of Christ. It just lays rules and regulations on it. I've said this for years. What happens is we tell people before they get saved, Oh, he that the Son is set free is free indeed. Because we're going to put you back under bondage when you join the church. Religion doesn't renew your mind to the finished work of Christ. Religion convinces you that you've got to finish the work that Christ started in you, even though the Bible's very clear that he will complete the work of which he started in you. I just need to submit to what God's saying in my life. In religion, you don't get to enjoy being the new you. You're burdened with the labor of becoming the new you. Does that make sense? Religious people insist that sin is the real cause of people losing their joy. But it's my observation that sin is the fruit of the problem, not the root of the problem. The root problem is always beliefs of the heart. Fruit doesn't go away permanently until it's dealt with at the root. The root problem is always beliefs of the heart. We need to change, we need to change some things about what we believe. Works righteousness, the idea that somehow I'm going to make all the difference in my life, it negates the work of the cross. My Christian life is really me submitting to the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life. The more, the, the more a person tries to earn righteousness, the more they convince their heart that they're not righteous. Let me, let me give you, I'm going to make this very simple for all of us to see. The more I go like this and say, 
man, i got to get better. It sounds like a great statement, doesn't it? But the more I say, i got to get better, I'm really saying I'm not as good as I could be. I'm certainly not saying I am complete in Christ. So we need to have some heart change. And I want you to see that, that, uh, that church attendance will never replace, can never replace true intimacy with God. Church attendance should be the result of having intimacy with God. Amen. The struggle between having the life of God and experiencing the life of God is the battle that rages between our mind and our heart. We have the life of God, but are we really experiencing the life of God? I can tell by some of the things I hear from some of you that you're not. I'm just going to be honest with you. Some of you aren't. Some of you go through the same struggle all the time because although I can preach the word and you can get it here, you haven't, through intimacy, let it become transformational. There's a disharmony going on inside of you. The blood of Jesus cleanses and thereby harmonizes our consciousness. Every time we revisit the truth, and restore fellowship. Religious people look to the outside sources at the problem. They fight the devil, totally ignoring Jesus' absolute victory over the devil. They focus on personal opposition as they create a martyr's complex. Being codependent, they always look outside themselves to meet a need that can only be met by God in their own heart. Rather than accept right responsibility, they always look for some place to lay blame. Their legalistic teaching has no place for accepting responsibility without placing blame. They cry out to God who's out there somewhere and pray a prayer that negates the cross of Christ. How can I say, Oh God, deliver me, if I really believe that he already delivered me on the cross? How can I say, oh God, heal me, if I believe healing is already mine because by his stripes we're healed. The Holy Spirit is within. The new man is within. The kingdom of God is within. The solution is within. I'm not being attacked from the outside. I'm being carnally minded. I'm more aware of what my five senses say than I am aware of what Christ is trying to say. I'm magnifying the problem. And Paul offers a three-phase solution. Number one, put off that old man. Number two, renew your mind. And thirdly, put on the new man. Now listen to this. I want you to get this. He didn't say repent. Why? Because repentance is implied by the fact that you need to renew your mind. He didn't tell you to confess because that's implied by the fact that you acknowledge your need to renew your mind. He didn't say God needed to do something on your behalf that would deny the finished work of Jesus. He didn't tell you to seek deliverance, although this process would facilitate the needed deliverance. He did not tell you there's something you lack, which you need to get from God. This would deny the reality that we're complete in Christ. The solution to these are behavioral issues. Put off the old man. Renew your mind. Put on the new man. Now I'm going to give you one scripture which is the answer to all that I'm saying today in the scriptures. I'm going to give you this. This is one scripture that wraps up this whole thing. I've got a few things I'll say after that, but I want you to note this scripture. Philippians 3.3 3 says this, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We worship God in the Spirit. We rejoice in the finished work of the cross, and we don't have any confidence in what we can do on our own. 
We don't have any confidence in the flesh. Paul's life was grounded in the... Uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin used to have a little book called In Him. And he get all the scriptures about what we are in him. But I love that Paul the Apostle had lived by those in him realities. He said, I am as he is because I am in him, because I share in his death, burial, and resurrection. We only share this identity when by active faith we abide in fellowship. He wanted to be found in him, not having his own righteousness, which is by the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Folks, our issue is do we have faith in Christ? Paul said this, that I may know or experience him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and be conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul knew that experiencing the, the resurrected life was not possible without the death of self. He said he wants to attain to that resurrection. This word means to arrive at it. It's not something earned. Let me end by this one statement. A heart change is only possible as we fellowship with Jesus and accept the reality of victory that Jesus bought for us. Do you receive that from the pastor this morning? We're ready for heart change.